My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. What's so funny? Why, Friday Follies, of course, right here on the Mutual Audio Network. <laughs> The following audio drama is rated R and is recommended restricted for anyone under the age of 17. Welcome to Investigation, the program that digs deep to find the truth behind the truth, and maybe even behind that truth too, with your host, John Crapwheeler. I'm John Crapwheeler, and welcome to Investigation. On tonight's program, a controversial new theory about the Great Irish Potato Famine. In 1845, the country of Ireland was struck with disaster when a blight destroyed the potato crop of that year, the main food source for all of the people of the country. Between 1845 and 1849, fully one million people, 12% of the population of the country, had starved to death, and another million had fled to places such as Canada, Britain, the United States, and Australia, in what was known as the Great Irish Diaspora. But was the blight principally responsible for this catastrophic famine? Were there other reasons? One man thinks so. Professor Connor McGee of the University of Dublin. Well, my research has shown that while the blight did account for a huge loss in the yield of the crop for 1845 regarding potatoes, um, the reality of the situation is it only accounted for one-third of the overall part of the famine. The other third could be accounted for the fact that in 1845 we had one of the largest uh, bumper crops of uh, whiskey that year. Distilleries were just working 24-7 to get the stuff out there, and we had a huge supply that could have lasted for several months um, unfortunately, this being Ireland, it was depleted by the early part of 1846, and that's when the deaths really started to rack up. Mostly it was from the withdrawal. But what of the other third? Here is where Professor McGee's research took a sudden and very sinister turn. In 1845, a third of the crop of potatoes for that year should have been enough to support the population, but that third went missing. My research shows that in 1845, the country of Canada had discovered poutine, and I believe that during this period, Canadian pirates were raiding Ireland to steal their potatoes. Was this true? Was there, in fact, a hitherto unknown chapter in Canadian history of tuber piracy? We asked Professor Jock McKenzie of the University of Ontario. Oh, cat's out of the bag, eh? Okay, yeah, it's true, you know. We had a lot of potato piracy going on in, like, the 1845-1849 area. Uh, we had sent a whole bunch of battalions of Canadian pirates over there to steal the potatoes and bring them back. Because, you know, poutine was just so darn popular. Records show that in 1845, the government of Canada had cut a very lucrative deal with the United States of America. They were trading beaver and seal pelts for an almost limitless supply of cheese curds and brown gravy. The potatoes, however, were another story entirely. Well, America in that year had just discovered hash browns, and therefore they were completely unwilling to part with their precious potato supply. What's more, America was willing to fight to the death to protect its potatoes. Therefore, drastic measures were taken. So it was in 1845 that the first wave of Canadian potato pirates arrived on Irish soil. During the raids, several uh, western townships were burned completely to the ground uh, by the attackers and uh, who were described by the survivors as completely ruthless, though surprisingly polite. But who were these dangerous men of the North Sea? Forgotten to history, they went by such names as Edward Mashed Black Newgate, Starchy Rock, and John Crinkle Cut Dunkirk. Blood soaked with cutlass and flintlock, they provided Canada with a supply of potatoes they desperately craved. But in 1851, all of that changed when the Canadians made a startling discovery. Uh, it turns out that they grow in the ground. You know, I don't know why, but for some reason, uh, we at the time uh, thought that the Irish made them by hand or something, and it was some secret recipe. <laughs> but it turns out they were a crop, you know. <laughs> oh boy, do we feel stupid. But with one million dead and one million displaced, the damage had already been done. And how does the country of Ireland feel about this now? Well, we were a bit miffed at first, I mean, but, you know, we decided to let bygones be bygones. I mean, especially since the fight was over potatoes. You can't stay mad at someone over that, you know. So we give the Canadians our blessing. A fine Irish blessing. Uh, one of my favourites. May the wind be at your back and may the road rise to greet you. Mm -hmm. ah. Ah. Oh, Patrick McSorley, you look a sight... What in God's name happened to you? I know, I was walking out of my house yesterday and this wind comes up behind me. Hmm? Starts pushing me right down the street. I Ooh. couldn't stop myself. Next thing I know, I step forward. The entire pavement comes up like a like I'd stepped on a rake or something. Ooh. Smacks me right in the face. 
only got out of hospital this morning. Oh, you look terrible, lad. I expect you'd be wanting a drink then. Well, yes. What's that got to do with my story? Hello, my name is Alvin O'Reilly, and I'm a member of the Irish American Anti Defamation League. I, for one, am tired of jokes such as this one that perpetuate the stereotype that Irish are heavy drinkers. As a teetotaling Irishman, I would like to see a portrayal of the Irish that is a little bit more diverse and positive. <laughs> ah, Patrick McSorley, you look a sight. Hi. What have you been up to? Well, I've just came back from teaching a class of school graders about ethics and morality via the works of Immanuel Kant. And you know what? They took to it beautifully. I think they'll all be fine upstanding citizens of our fair nation. Ah, it sounds like it. It does my heart proud. Uh, so I expect you'll be wanting a drink then. Line them up. I'm sick and tired of being around those little bastards. August 31st, 2007, and you are experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by. I'm your host, Kai and Chris Conroy, and this is, in fact, Tech Diff, the Technical Difficulties Podcast, comedy, sketch comedy, hilarity, all written, produced, and performed by moi. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, giving my little podcast a spin here. Um... Well, I really haven't got anything huge to report since last week. I'd like to thank everybody for the nice emails and letters. They seem to like my story about Neil Gaiman. Gee, maybe I might have another story for you very soon. Maybe this episode. I don't know. I'm not sure what I have planned right off the top of my head. i got to get further away from the mic. It just banged into the pop screen there. All right. My glasses always catch the pop screen. Very strange. Anyway, um, why don't I tell you more about that and other things at the back end of uh, this. Are you having problems with depression? Can't cope with life? We have a solution for you. Just go to a genre-related convention, preferably a specific one like Gargoyles, ElfQuest, or possibly even a furry convention. You'll be surrounded by drunken, dysfunctional lunatics in crazy costumes, and as a result, you'll feel a lot better about yourself. Once that happens, you can head over to the hotel bar, kick back, have a drink, and enjoy the mayhem all around you. And I mean that sincerely. I mean, just because the con-goers are nuts doesn't mean they're not nice people. You could make some friends, for all you know. Just do your best not to get your picture taken by anybody, lest you wind up on a Photoshop contest at Fark.com or something awful. That's what happened to me, and I haven't lived it down since. Hey, Greenleaf Night Branch, you gonna be at that microphone all day or what? <laughs> uh... Yes, sir, what can I do to help you? Is this the hotel where they're holding the Gargoyles Convention? Yes, it is. Thank heavens! For a moment there, I thought I'd lost my mind. Either that or the gates of hell had opened up under your establishment and ejected only the lamest of demons. And are you with either of the conventions here, sir? Oh, is there a second one going on simultaneously, then? Yes, sir, it's the biannual gathering of young Earth creationist nudist furries. Really? So, um, tell me, how does that work? They wear nothing but the head part of the fursuits. Hmm. I seem to have stumbled into some sort of nexus point of pure madness, haven't I? Yes, sir, and take it from first-hand experience, no amount of therapy, religion or pharmaceuticals will erase the experiences you're about to have. I see. Well, I was going to check into your establishment here so that I could uh, set up a business meeting with a high-powered client of mine, but I've decided instead to quit that job and procure a high-definition video camera and make a documentary film. Really? So you're in the film industry, then? We'll be in about an hour. Looking for any casting couch fodder later on? Possibly, but I should warn you my bedroom tastes are a little advanced. Sir, I work in a hotel that regularly hosts genre conventions. Nothing frightens me. My kind of girl. Yes, it truly is wonderful to live a life without fear, isn't it? Hello, my name is Dr. Troy Mackle, and I am an expert on phobia. Boogity boogity! <laughs> Did I scare you? Of course I didn't scare you. That doesn't even work on my kids anymore. <laughs> now, when I want to scare my kids, I just wait till they're asleep and set off live explosives under their bed. That gets them up! Phobia is defined as an uncontrollable and irrational fear. They can often induce anxiety, panic attacks, hissy fits, wetting your pants, and screaming like a little girl. This situation can be highly debilitating, especially for people who have phobias about screaming little girls. And it's like this kind of weird fear-based Mobius loop. The concept of phobia is often misused by popular culture. For example, people of a deep religious nature who are against homosexuality for faith reasons are often referred to as homophobes. They are not, in fact, homophobes. They are bigoted, small-minded, moronic dumb shits, but they are not, in fact, homophobes. Here is a list of some phobias that you may or may not be familiar with. Try and collect a set. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but if you need a hobby, there's one right there. Algophobia, the fear of pain. Heliophobia, the fear of the sun. Monophobia, 
the fear of solitude, arachnophobia, the fear of spiders, arachnophobia phobia, the fear of movies about spiders starring Jeff Daniels, claustrophobia, the fear of Santa, pantophobia, the fear of trousers, and flava flava phobia. Fear of a black planet. If you have these or any other types of irrational fears, remember that it's not your fault that you're an easily frightened simpering sissy Mary. There is help. Simply call the number that's on your screen right now, and my office will send around someone to point and laugh derisively at you until your problem goes away. It's a free service. No, really, we enjoy it. Hold it right there, you. You're under arrest under the pretext of ending this joke. Joke stoppers. Fearless men and women in blue who know how to stop jokes. Dead. Hey, Captain, what's the problem? There's something funny going on around here, Stuart, and it's our job to stop it. So anyway, this guy walks into a bar and... Walk uh... into this bar! Oh, oh, ow! Joke stoppers, you're busted, yo! Joke stoppers, it's where the laughter dies. Tuesday nights at 11. It seemed innocent enough, but that was how it all began. America's darkest hour kicked off in late 2007. After nearly a decade of some of the most idiotic and moronic policies the American people had ever seen, the national pastime seemed to turn into lampooning and ridiculing our government. The sheer level of corruption, hypocrisy, and incompetence had made it so that almost anyone could, just by merely opening their mouth, turn into a satirist of one stripe or another. It was the only natural human defense, it seemed, that the United States citizens even had against the sheer monolithic stupidity of our own government. But it was this reaction itself that the neoconservative movement decided was undermining America America's war on terror. And with that in mind, President George W. Bush enacted powers of the Patriot Act and declared political humor an act of terrorism in and of itself. Commentators such as John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, and Stephanie Miller were rounded up and shipped off to detention centers in South America. But that was only the beginning, for soon humor itself was seen as a subversive act. Several local governments around the country made it a crime to not take things seriously. People were issued tickets for smiling quietly to themselves. And comedy in America was driven underground. Yes, comedians themselves had been deemed enemies of the state, and were referred to by the Fox News broadcasters as comedy munists. And people would have loved to have pointed out what a desperately poorly thought out and stupid moniker that was, but frankly, they were too afraid to. Around the world, America was viewed both by friend and foe alike as a complete laughingstock. And that was our pretext to invade. But the tyranny was soon to end, for a brave enclave of stand-up comedian satirists and podcasters fought back with everything they had. Slapstick, sarcasm, anecdotes, bizarre asides, rubber chickens, prop humor, and the, of course, the guns and rockets didn't hurt either. And America and the world was brought back to freedom. By comedy. So always remember that comedy is liberty. So when you're looking to invest your hard-earned dollars in something useful and something that supports America, why not consider donating it to a comedian? I've got a link to my PayPal account over at techdiff.com. So you can just go over there, click that, and send money. Because don't you think mom and apple pie deserve the... Pe- <coughs> Ow! Take that, you self-serving bastard. As long as I'm talking about comedy here, I'd like to end with a little story that I call the perfect dismount. There are many ways to be funny. But here are two key ones. The first is responsive humor. Someone says something and you manage to come up with a quick comeback. This is how most people handle it, and it's sort of hit or miss depending on how clever and how quick you are. But what most professional comedians do is the following, and it's the same thing they do in their act. It's having a back pocket in their mind full of material that they can pull out just in case the need arises. The proof in this is watching a comedian. When they do their act live, they'll often do a set bunch of jokes about a particular subject. Then they'll be interviewed on a show like Larry King, and you'll notice that the same jokes will crop up when Larry King asks them about the same subject, like marriage or politics. The problem in my particular case is that if you're a guy like me, your observations aren't really all that normal. Like, I have a really, really great joke about Aristotelian logic. Unfortunately, that doesn't come up in conversations very much, and if I try to steer the conversation in that direction, no one will talk to me. But every once in a while, the demon gods of comedy are merciful, even if there's only a handful of people around to see it. I was talking with my friend David Cummer, with whom we did the program Channel Surfing Wipeout, and who at the time was a roommate of myself and my wife Susan's. He was describing how he at one time had a cat named Carp. He was inspired to name his cat this because he was a fan of a Minnesota-based cartoonist named Gindon, who often used carp in his cartoons. This is because in Minnesota, in our lakes and in our rivers, the carp is ubiquitous. They are cagey and, to my knowledge, completely inedible. Left virtually unmolested by fishermen, they grow to enormous sizes here. Walk by any one of our local lakes in the park on a sunny day and you will see these large gray fish sliding through the shallow areas. They are also extremely long-lived fish, and I pointed out in my end of the conversation that in places like Japan and in other parts of Asia, the carp is revered as a symbol of longevity. David declared how he supposed to figure out how old a carp is. And it was at that point that I sensed oh so faintly 
the advent of one of the gods of comedy. I had a joke for this moment, for this subject, a delightful, awful groaner of a joke. But I couldn't pull it out just yet. The moment hadn't quite arrived. I had to see if I could tease it. I wondered if the gods were in my favor. I said, David, you could probably figure it out by the size. I mean, they probably grow a certain amount of size per year, some inches or pounds or something like that. I mean, I can't think of another way. Can you? Please take the bait. Please. He replied, maybe you can cut them open and count the rings. I was within the zone of perfection. I could have dove on the joke right now, but I was willing to risk it because it wasn't quite perfect. I was aiming for what I call the perfect dismount. When all the pieces of the joke fall into your lap, you assemble them beautifully and hand them back. It's perfect. It's, it's absolutely, you can't get it better. No matter how bad the joke is, this was the time and place for it. It would have been forced if I jumped on it too soon. I had to risk just a little more, so I went for it. I said, actually, David, the way you have to find out how old a carp is is you have to check its ID. He said, carp don't have ID. They don't have pockets. And lo, the gods of comedy had bestowed upon me the gift of the perfect setup. And so, with a perfectly pleasant look on my face, I made the following response. Well, David, you see, carps keep their ID in their wallets, but since they don't have pockets, they have to share a wallet and they pass it back and forth to each other. It's called carp-to-carp -carp walleting. David stood there momentarily like a moose in the headlights, whereupon I stood up in front of the couch, my arms raised over my head and one foot planted forward in the universal gymnastic symbol of the perfect dismount. Thank you and good night. <laughs> That's the end of that. This has been Tech Diff for August 31st. Good God, August 31st. It's going to be September tomorrow. August 31st, 2007. Oh, we're coming up on autumn already, are we? <laughs> anyway, this is the first show I've done after getting uh, the new garage band working. Um, although I have to say, as I was working on it today, that it's not working entirely well. It seems to keep forgetting, or my computer seems to keep forgetting where all my loops are. I have the uh, Apple's uh, orchestral soundtrack and I would and a orchestral loops and I've also got or the symphonic loops or whatever those are and the uh, I got those and I've got the uh, the voices loops that we just got and I installed all of them and now the machine doesn't seem to know where they are. In fact, my computer doesn't even seem to know where they are. I guess I'll just have to reinstall them again and see what the heck happens. Other than that, I seem to be very happy with GarageBand. Uh, to to tell you what went wrong. Um, Never install GarageBand if you have a previous version hiding somewhere on an external drive, which I thought worked to my advantage because then I would have something to record off of because I couldn't get GarageBand 4 to work. But it turns about, out that GarageBand 4 wasn't working because GarageBand 3 was already in existence somewhere on the computer, which screwed things up rather badly. And I had to uninstall and reinstall everything a couple of times before I could get it to work properly. And as I said now, I'm still not sure I'm getting it to work properly. So there you go. Before I go any further at all, I would like to uh, mention that Gene over at the Shallow Gene Pool uh, podcast also has a new podcast called Rejection Letter Audio, uh, which is a podcast uh, which uh, is about people who, you know, it's about writers who get rejection letters and they can share their stories with, uh, with people on this podcast. And it's over at uh, feeds.feedburner.com slash rejection letter audio. Or just look up Rejection Letter Audio podcast. I'll try to put a link on it on my site. But um, my site isn't working very well either. I'm having a hard time putting those links in. I've got to change up a lot of things because evidently technology hates my guts right now. So um, anyway, uh, that's about that. If you guys want to send me and send me contact me in any way, I have I am so far behind on my mail as usual because I suck. And I will do my best to get in touch with people who have sent me podcasts and other things. I've just ugh, I'm so sorry about that. I just I'm really bad about responding to emails and stuff, but. If you want to get in touch with me, oh, that's a great incentive to, to, to get in touch with me, isn't it? If you want to get in touch with me, you can leave a comment over at techdiff.com or you could www.techdiff.com or send me a, um, a Gmail at techdiff at gmail.com, T E K D I F F, at gmail.com. And uh, I'll get back to you as soon as time allows or as soon as I remember to do it. See, I'm an idiot because what happens is mail comes in and I check it and then it falls out of my inbox. Well, it's still in my inbox, but it's not in my urgent or you haven't read this mail yet. It just kind of disappears off the list. And so I then I forget about it because <laughs> I'm an idiot. And then I never sit down to, like I need to sit down and start responding to the mail right away. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'm bending your ear off for nothing. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back again next week with more audio. 
and more stuff and more stories and like that. I hope you enjoyed the show this week. And um, check out my wife's podcast at uncomfortable-questions.com. And uh, that's it. Nothing new at channelsurfingwipeout.com. I've got some cool ideas coming up for upcoming shows I keep mentioning to you, and they never materialize. That's par for the course for me. But you actually will be getting some cool stuff from me very, very soon. So take care, and I'll see you guys all next week. You're listening to Friday Follies. Jokes, laughs, and guffaws to tickle your funny bone on the Mutual Audio Network. Join us tomorrow morning on Mutual for Saturday Story Circle. Bring the kids, your coloring books, and crayons, and get the whole family into a great start to the day with audio cartoons. You can always subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of audio drama that fits your fancy. Or discover Saturday Story Circle in your favorite podcast players like Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, or Spotify. The Mutual Audio Drama Network, where we listen and imagine together.